very much, uh, Dr. Walid, colleagues, and indeed uh, to Dr. Abdullah Shah, professor, who put all this together. I think it takes a lot of effort to put such a prestigious meeting. Uh, I'm sure we all benefit from this. Um, I'm going to talk briefly today about a cardiogenic shock. This is an entity which we all face, face with, and they really have quite poor outcome. Now, is there anything new on the horizon to improve outcome in our patients presenting with this? I'll be talking uh, about in details. In terms, I'm going to define the cardiogenic shock to start with, so we all set the algorithm. Epidemiology, indeed, certainly there is a call for action. The treatment, what are the options to treat our cardiogenic shock patients? And what are the advances in treatment in cardiogenic shock? A definition, I think we're all familiar with this. It's a systolic blood pressure less than 90 for 30 minutes. Um, the supportive measure uh, to maintain systolic blood pressure uh, indeed, to be taken, end organ hyperperfusion, cool extremities, urine output less than 30 mLs per hour, and heart rate more than 60 beat per minute. I'm sure we all see those patients, and once we see them coming through the, the ER, we directly direct into the cath lab, but bearing in mind what, how poor the prognosis is. More in, de in depth, the hemodynamics, the cardiac index is less than 2.5 pressure is above 15 millimeter mercury. This, is, this definition is taken from the largest randomized control trial, which is the shock trial. Is the incidence of cardiogenic shock decreasing or increasing? This is data, national data in the US looking comparison between, as you can see, 2003 to up to 2010. Unfortunately, it is going up with the cases of acute myocardial infarction presenting with cardiogenic shock. And if you compare 2010 versus 2014, based on age, you can see the difference quite significant. There is quite close to 53%. I mean, this is a actually it's quite bad news for us as an outcome and for our patients indeed. The, the shock uh, remains leading cause of mortality in acute myocardial infarction. We know this, we've seen it many times and still hovering, as you can see in this publication uh, in 2008, around 50% mortality. This is in hospital mortality. One in two of your patients dies during their admission to hospital, despite everything we do for them. Um, it doesn't stop there by the, the, by the time they are discharged. There is an adding 10% mortality uh, within 60 days from discharge. So this entity of cardiogenic shock, it really is a predictor of very poor outcome. Now we just talk briefly about mortality in PCI with cardiogenic shock. It's still a very, very challenging clinical scenario. Again, this is in a, in a registry of over 32,000 patients showing the mortality rate. This is 2005 to 2006 and compared to 2011, 2013, there is no improvement in outcome in those patients. You can see it's still the mortality remain quite high, um, despite everything we do for those patients. Acute MI shock, this is a US national database. They are primarily treated in community hospitals, not in the academic government hospital. I think I would like to emphasize in the UAE, the, it's, it's the opposite. And it's luckily for the patients, they are treated in academic government hospital with a high volume, they can take care of those very high risk patients where the uh, ECAS or the ambulance services are directing most acute MI patients towards government academic hospitals. Um, on the right hand screen, you can see the, uh, the data again, 2005, 2006 and 2011, 2013, showing the outcome as predicted 
in high volume academic centers is always better than low volume small institutions. What are the treatment? I mean, probably the standalone treatment for all cardiogenic patients, as we all do, um, it's revascularization. Where's the evidence behind this? As you all know, within 20, 12 hours of admission with the STEMI, this is a class 1A uh, for patients. So any of your patients had an MI within 12 hours and coming with a cardiogenic shock, we should perform revascularization. The, the level of evidence goes down to 1B only uh, in patients at any stage with acute MI who develop cardiogenic shock during uh, and are suitable candidates. Remember, not all candidates are suitable for PCI. Um, those we should consider in them, uh, indeed, urgent bypass craft surgery. But the level of evidence is 1B in this category. This is the ESC guidelines, as you can see, um, which hasn't changed much. Uh, it's still 1B, an immediate PCI for patient with cardiogenic shock if coronary anatomy is suitable. If it's not suitable for PCI or PCI failed, emergency cabbage is recommended. Now, I don't think there is any national UAE database, and I think there's a shout for this to be done, a registry like this, uh, probably with Professor Abdullah, uh, to, to publish uh, some data from, from UAE. This is from the shock trial, the primary study endpoint was all cause mortality or renal replacement therapy. This is comparing multivessel PCI versus culprit vessel PCI. And no surprise, the um, immediate multivessel PCI came superior, as you can see, with a p value 0 0.01. Indeed, with a narrow confidence interval, as you can see and relative risk reduction, it's 0.83. Now coming to touching br briefly on mechanical circulatory support. I think most of us in the cath lab see somebody in cardiogenic shock. The first thing we ask for, can we get the balloon pump? Is that the right thing to do for our patients? Or is it just an historic way of doing it? Makes us feel better as interventionists rather than the patient itself. Now, the mechanical support, as you know, there are a different variety of options available in the majority of the centers and the high volume academic centers. The basic one is intraaortic balloon pump. Indeed, Impella, which is taking quite a long way into, into in the majority of the cath labs, there is the, we've seen the tand tandem, uh, tandem, uh, tandem heart and the, indeed the ECMO. As you can see, each one of these modalities has different advantages and disadvantages. I won't go through the details of this because they are a lot. However, I think the Impala is probably the most feasible and perhaps the most beneficial uh, device among all. And I would just emphasize on myocardial oxygen demand. If you watch the bottom, uh, the bottom line, you can see the impeller comes on top of everyone else. And this is one of our main targets in those patients in order to improve their outcome is to reduce the myocardial oxygen demand. Now, looking at the evidence. Again, going, coming back to the balloon pump, simple, easy to use. It takes a couple of minutes. Usually we use in the UK, our registrar used to stick the balloon pump in just before even we start. Did that make any difference? As you can see in the, in the randomized control trial, which is intra aortic balloon pump shock two trial. I won't talk about shock one because it was a very small number of patients, only 40 patients. The second, the, the shock two was 600 patients, which is reasonable number in terms of randomized control trial. And it showed no difference whatsoever if you stick a balloon pump in your patients uh, before revascularization. That was versus medical management. Um, the impeller. Where is the evidence behind the impeller? This is, apology. This is the FDA recommendation. 
as you can see, they, they recommended certain indication for Impella. And uh, I would read it just briefly for you. The Impella 2.5, Impella CP, or Impella 5, and Impella LD, in conjunction with the automated Impella controller console, are intended for short-term use. And the short-term varies from four days, extended sometimes, to six days, depends on which Impella device you are using. This is with the cardiogenic patients that occurs immediately less than 48 hours following acute myocardial infarction or open heart surgery as a result of isolated left ventricular failure that is not responsive to optimal medical management and conventional treatment measures with or without intra-aortic balloon pump. I don't have the figures how many patients we've been used balloon pump with them, but even with the balloon pump, you can recommend it to use the Impella if you already use the balloon. The intent of the Impella system therapy is to reduce ventricular work and to provide the circulatory support necessary to allow heart recovery and early assessment of residual myocardial function. Data supporting the FDA indication, as you can see, the numbers are small. And I will touch pure, uh, briefly on the challenges facing conducting trials on these very high-risk sick patients. The Recover One FDA study, there was only 17 patients um, between the two arms, Impella and off Impella. The ISAR shock are randomized control trial. There was 26 patients and 13 in the Impella arm. The US Impella Registry, which is the biggest one, only 400 patients reduced in each arm. Literature review, over 2,000 patients, only 692 received Impella device. In the protected PCI, you can see the, again, the numbers are small, however, they're a little bit higher than the Impella in the randomized trials. The randomization acute MI cardiogenic shock is very challenging. And I can show you this, this illustrates how many trials they've stopped enrollment due to the fact that it's, uh, it, it's very, very challenging and very difficult. And I can show you the French trial in 2006 was discontinued due to low enrollment. Uh, the IMPRESS trial in 2007 also was discontinued due to low enrollment. They recover two FDA and the Danish shock still enrolling, despite the fact so far, this is started 2012, and we have yet still about 50 to 60 patients in the trial. So there is really a very challenging time to uh, recruit those patients and conduct such very difficult studies. In the population, studies showed reduced mortality with percutaneous VAD in acute MI cardiogenic shock. Now, the VAD, we not many centers here. I think in the UAE, there's only one or two centers that use the LVAD and percutaneous VAD. Now, this uh, demands a high volume, high experience team, ready team 24-7 in order to be able to use the, the PVAD in those patients. But this is a device that has shown significant improvements in outcome in mortality in acute MI presenting with cardiogenic shock. And as you can see here, it's the data speaks for itself. We're all familiar, I think, with Impella. Uh, we'll just touch briefly on the physiology and hemodynamics using the Impella device. As you can see, the, 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 the main priority in this one, reduce the oxygen demand and increase the oxygen supply. And the Impella does all that, uh, regardless which device you use, whether 2.5 or 5, whichever device you use, the outcome is always uh, related to this. Now, there is an issue about vascular access for Impella, as we all, I think some of us experience this but some centers that are using the auxiliary, there are various options available for sometimes for a 21 French access for the Impella. And I think it's just like the TAVI access, eventually it will improve the, and reduce the, the, the vascular access size. The IMPRESS trial 2017 published in JAK, again, just looking at days since randomization, those patients 
180 days and looking at impeller CP versus intra-aortic balloon pump. I don't think there's any brain about this, where the certainly impeller will come on top. Cardiogenic shock, we're all familiar with the physiology and the hemodynamics of this. Um, the death, the mortality remains high, and I'll emphasize on this, there's still running around 50% of all patients. Half of them, they die in our cath lab or on our CCU. Now, again, coming back to the same point, I think UAE is unique in that among the GCC that all acute MIs, they are transferred to government hospital, which makes quite a difference. In, in high volume, highly experienced centers, the outcome without a doubt is much, much better than in a district hospital with very low volume centers. Unfortunately, I think in the US experience, the majority of those patients are treated in the district hospital before they reach a tertiary center. And you can see here the survival to explant, what's the ratio, and I'll show you here distribution of pillar site outcomes. If you can see the outcomes, 22% relative improvement in overall outcomes since March 2016, depending on the center that being used in it. The right ventricular support, I think very few of us, they pay attention to the right ventricle hemodynamics importance during any invasive procedure, let alone during cardiogenic shock. The right ventricular assisting device, the ECMO we are all familiar with, the Sentry Mac ventricular assist device, I think it's just we've heard about it, we've never used it, and certainly Impella right side. Again, this is the, the, the technical difference between them, including the cost. I mean, as you can see, the Impella is not a cheap device, but however, like any device, like the gluten extents, like Tavi, the, the more we use it, that the cost will go down. That's inevitable. The industry will always follow us as the leaders. Standard approach, we should always have a protocol in our cath labs, in our emergency department to, for those dedicated patients who are very high risk. The entire team has to be aware of those sick patients. Time is muscle, we all know this in acute MI, let alone in, my, in cardiogenic shock. Therefore, every second count in those patients. Early initiation of hemodynamic support, I mean, I would advise every center, if it is at all possible in UAE, to have impeller device, because that will make quite a big difference. Balloon pump is really useless. We are wasting our time. We're increasing the vascular complication for no benefit whatsoever based on the evidence we've seen, and there is a barrage of evidence behind this. Indeed, hemodynamic monitoring is essential in those patients. A catheter in the right ventricle or right atrium will have a quite significant impact on how we manage our patients, and indeed, it can improve their outcomes. I'll, I'll stop here on this, just purely on the advances, and thank you very much.